awareness of our oneness. One source, one consciousness, one God, one life. A unity and diversity in which you are welcomed in this moment. So here we are in this very grand room with plenty of seats and just a few of us. So we should make ourselves comfortable and be somewhat informal for the evening. I'm reminded of a story. Once upon a time, I was with my teacher, who was a very grand uh, Indian guru. Traveling in New York, and we had a program for him at Columbia University, prestigious university, and a very grand hall for the presentation. And we made all of the preparations, and he arrived dutifully at the appointed time. And only one person showed up. Now, this was Columbia University, it had thousands of students, and here he was with just one person. So we went to him and we said, Only one person has come, we'll cancel the program, you can go back to your quarters. He said, No, no, one person has come. And he gave his entire program to the one person who came. So by those standards, <clears throat> we have multiplied the experience this evening. The understanding is that consciousness or truth or life is the one in the many. And so if even one person presents themselves, you are in the presence of the divine. And in this understanding, you share communion. Hmm? So we could live in our limited stories about what is happening, or we could be in the truthful awareness that there is communion happening if we are open to it. So let's look at our theme this evening as we work out our sound challenges. Ah, that's better. Our theme is living with balance in an imbalanced world. And we'll start with a quotation. And the quotation is, for every force in life, there is a counterforce. Mastery is balance. To understand the nature of this quotation and the nature of we have to understand the nature of the nature of the reality that we, as human beings, are experiencing or not experiencing. And the nature of the reality that we are either experiencing or not experiencing has been discussed and delineated and questioned by human beings throughout human history. And they have evolved models of reality. And in the progressive development of the philosophies of life and models of reality, holistic models of reality have been in consensus in the West for 350 years since the age of idealism. But those models have remained academic. In other words, they are discussed in universities and scholarly places. And although there is agreement and consensus that reality 
is one and single, we have not actualized the lifestyle that would validate our intellectual understanding of the nature of reality. So for a brief moment, let's review the holistic model of reality. The holistic model of reality is holistic because it posits one essence as the nature of reality, whether we call that source or we call it consciousness or we call it God or we call it life. In essence, there is only one. For example, in this moment, with all of us here in this room, one life animates all of us. If I in your eyes, I see the same life looking back at me. In truth, there is only one, whether we call it life, whether we call it consciousness, whether we call it source, whether we call it God makes no difference. The one is the many. But how did the one become the many? Why did the one become the many? And this is the nature of the holistic model of reality says that the one had the intention to be itself, to fully be itself. And in order to be itself, it had to experience itself. And the only way it could experience itself was to create a relative reality because all experience is relative. In order for you to experience that you are, you must have the simultaneous experience that you are not. Because I am is only ever in relation to I am not. So one consciousness creates itself as reality, meaning we have two polarities, an interior and an exterior, a subject and an objective, a positive and negative, a being, and a becoming. And this represents polarized consciousness or the nature of relative reality. And through the interaction of our polarities, we experience either what we are not or what we are. <clears throat> consciousness then proceeds in its manifestation through many dimensions of experience from the most subtle unified levels where the polarities are experienced as the same one. Subject and object are the same consciousness. To the densest levels of the physical, emotional, and the mental, where consciousness is imbalanced in its relative polarities and fragments its experience and forfeits the awareness of itself as one. <clears throat> so, the statement, for every force in life there is a counterforce, mastery is balance, has to do with the very nature of relative reality and our particular experience as forms of consciousness within relative reality. At the densest level of our experience, the physical, what happens? One polarity dominates the other. We experience imbalance. We are fragmented and we have a fraudulent perception of reality, an illusory perception of reality. We perceive that everything is separate from everything else. In other words, you are separate from the person sitting next to you. You are separate from me. You are separate and independent from the world around you. And according to quantum mechanics and the most ancient of the holistic models of reality on this planet, that is illusion. It is not a truthful perception of reality. <clears throat> With our own modern science and our own modern technology, we can now prove at the subatomic particulate level, the quantum level of experience, everything is one. But here we are, lost in our illusory perception that everything is not one. So therefore, we are dominant in the experience of what we are not, which 
was the intention in our consciousness to begin with that was necessary for it to be able to experience what it is. First had to experience what it is not so that relationally it can experience what it is. So here we are living in a very imbalanced world where the perception of reality is mostly fraudulent and the experience of most human beings is illusion. <clears throat> now, most of us as human beings on this planet think that we are sane, mm -hmm. meaning we are in touch with true reality. We refer to somebody who is insane as somebody who's not in touch with truthful reality. But from the perspective of the holistic models of reality and quantum science, the majority of humanity is really insane. Less than 3% of the human population has a truthful perception of reality. So in terms of the truth, we could say only 2 to 3% of the human population is sane. The other 90-some percent is insane meaning not in touch with truthful reality, not having a truthful experience of what life is and who we are. So we're living with great imbalance in an imbalanced world. But the quotation says, for every force in life there is a counterforce. Mastery is balance. You can look at all the holistic models of reality all the way back through human recorded history for eight to 10,000 years, and they will all say the same thing. Balance, whether it is the golden balance of Buddhism, or it is the balance principle of the Veda and the Tantra, or in even the Western traditions. If you walk into this place this evening and you look at the logo of Bafta, <clears throat> what do you see? a face, a mask. And how is that mask, that face displayed? Did you notice that one eye is solid and the other eye is empty or open? Hmm? Denotes the principle of relative reality. One eye corresponds to the opposite side of the brain, the other eye to the other side of the brain. The left eye corresponds to the right brain Right eye corresponds to the left brain. What you see in that logo hmm, is a state of balance represented in the human form. One eye is closed or looking inward. The other eye is open and looking outward. Relative reality represented in every possible way on this planet. And yet, we are basically unaware of it. We look at these logos, we look at these forms, we look at these models, and we don't really understand what it is they are trying to communicate. So, <clears throat> balance or imbalance. Mastery is balance, say all the traditions. But here we are with extreme imbalance. So what's the remedy? Hmm? The remedy is to emphasize the non-dominant polarity. So if the objective is the dominant polarity, what must we do? We must emphasize the subjective. If the negative is the dominant polarity, we'd have to emphasize the positive. <clears throat> if the majority of human experience is imbalanced and fragmented, and it is life negative and fear-based, then the remedy is to emphasize the opposite, life affirmation and love-based experience. <clears throat> so all the techniques and all the technologies of all the holistic models of reality have to do with the mechanics of balance. And the foremost balancing technique in all of the traditions is meditation. Meditation is simply a balancing technique. Why? What happens when you meditate? You close your eyes and you emphasize the non-dominant polarity, the interior, the subjective. 
through all the waking hours of our day, what are we doing? Our eyes are open and we are objectively, negatively focused. We are imbalanced in our relative polarities. We close our eyes to meditate, a natural balance takes place. And then it is said in the holistic model of reality that wholeness or unification in our consciousness is proportional to balance. So when you experience balance in a meditative protocol, what happens? Your awareness expands. Your whole perception of reality shifts. You move from a fragmented, insane perception of reality to a truthful, holistic, sane perception of reality. You begin to see and perceive that everything is modifications of the same essential energy. Everything is myriad modifications of the same life that animates you, that animates all and everything. So meditation is basically a balancing technique. Now, these models and the mechanics of their actualization have again been in consensus for hundreds of years on this planet. Our failure has been that they remain purely intellectual. What we have in the West especially is intellectual enlightenment. We think that if we understand something, that means we are experiencing it. But the truth is, we are not. Intellectual enlightenment is a limited enlightenment. It is void of existential experience. So we have yet to actualize in the West the holistic lifestyle that conforms to the holistic model of reality. In other words, what our science and our philosophical systems are telling us is the truth we have yet to embrace in our lifestyle moment by moment. Therefore, we know what the truth is, but we don't experience it. And this is the predicament of our current world situation, and especially so in the West, because the West is still actualizing its myth, its highest myth, which would be its spiritual myth. We are still mired here in the West in the material myth. <clears throat> A good example of that would be compare it to the East. I just came from India. If you are in India, they have actualized the highest level of human myth, which is spiritual. The hero, the enculturated hero of the average school person, child in India, would be a Buddha, personifies the enlightenment that is possible in human experience. Move to the West, where we are still mired in the material myth, and what is the hero of the young school child? It's the basketball player who makes several million dollars a year. Different myths, different actualizations, different manifestations of the ultimate experience of life. But nevertheless, the model remains, and we are evolving our lifestyle through our understanding of the nature of reality. Now we have to bring ourselves as cultures to the full actualization of holistic experience mm, through the mechanics of consciousness within the holistic model of reality, which is basically learning how to live with balance in an imbalanced world. So if meditation mm, is the foremost balancing technique and it is a subjectively dominant focus, then holistic lifestyle employs the same mechanics. It simply says, you have to emphasize the positive in everything you do. You have to find life affirmation and love to balance life negation and fear, which is the dominant. So the holistic model of reality is really very simple. At every level of your experience, every dimension of our experience, physical, emotional, mental, we have to emphasize the non-dominant opposite polarity. We have to emphasize the interior, 
We have to emphasize the positive. We have to emphasize love. We have to emphasize the truth. And if we can do so, we can create balance and proportional to our balance is our wholeness and our truthful perception of reality. So holistic lifestyle is slowly unfolding in the West. Uh, and we are embracing it in many ways, incrementally, uh, but in many ways. Let's look at the physical dimension of experience. We have finally begun to discover that a physical dimension of our experience is also based on balance or imbalance. If we simply look at the biochemistry of the physical dimension of our experience, it tells a story. To look at two polarities, insulin and glucose. If they are in a balanced ratio, we have physical health and well-being. If they are imbalanced, we have disease. What determines our glucose insulin balance or imbalance? What we eat, the fuel that we provide these forms with. Do we provide the food in a very balanced biochemical way? Or do we just eat unconsciously whatever tastes good and who cares whether it's imbalanced in terms of insulin and glucose? We are waking up to the fact that if we are conscious in what we consume, uh, we can create balance at the physical level of our experience. Also, we understand now that the movement of the energy field through the physical system of our body is also as important as is our diet. If we don't exercise and move the energy every day, the physical body polarities go out of balance and we experience imbalance. So we've discovered that proper nutrition and proper exercise can balance the biochemistry of the physical body. That's one dimension of our experience. Next dimension, emotional. Are we emotionally balanced or are we constantly, automatically, unconsciously invested in fear and the negative judgment of the life around us? If we are, which is the norm for most people, same remedy. You can consciously grab the reins of your emotional flow and direct it to the positive. You know, people will often uh, question that. They'll say to me, how can I experience love if I have no one who loves me? And the answer to that is, be love. It's a choice you make. In this moment, can you not emphasize love in your experience? Can you not have love for the life that animates the form that you're in? Can you not flow love simply out of the joy of being? Can you not create a love-dominant experience in relation to a fear-dominant experience? Again, these are choices we make moment by moment, day by day. Balance the emotional dimension by emphasizing the non-dominant, the positive. Take it to the mental level of experience, another dimension. Hmm? We are, for the most part, negative in our data. We are lost in the illusion of separation. Can we change our thinking? Can we grab the reins of our mind and direct it to the truth? Constantly mastering it, holding the reins of it, not letting it automatically run off into its illusory stories. If we can do so, we can balance the mental dimension. Then an interesting thing happened, according to the holistic models of reality. And what is that? That is that when we hold each of these of our densest dimensions in balance, in duration, they become harmonically interactive. And when they become harmonically interactive, they affect the very DNA of our forms. And the DNA changes. It changes the rate of its spin. And when it changes the rate of its spin and moves to a non-stressed frequency of vibration, 
the dimensions that are subtle beyond it open. And then we experience a change in our perception of reality. Our perception of reality moves from fragmented to holistic. So we hold the reins to our experience. It's our choice. We can either balance the denser dimensions of our experience, or we can choose not to. And in that understanding, here's the good news or the bad news. We are the creators of our reality. Sorry, but what you experience is your choice. <laughs> Consciously or unconsciously, it makes no difference. At some level of your experience, your experience corresponds to your choice. <clears throat> so you wouldn't be here in this room, in this moment, dialoguing about this subject unless at some level of your being it was your choice. Which is to say, then, the subject matter, holistic reality, is the experience whose time has come for you. Oh. It's very validating. Hmm? <laughs> So here we are, contemplating the nature of reality and how we are the creators of our experience within it. And beginning to understand that, the game that we are playing is simply a game, like any other game. And the game is called human experience. And as with any other game you play, if you don't understand the rules of the game, how can you masterfully play it? So we have to understand the holistic model of reality and the mechanics of its actualization in order to apply it to the game that we're playing called life as human beings. And then based on our understanding and application, we can bring this experience to mastery. And what did that quotation at the beginning say? Mastery is balance. Hmm? The mechanics of the game we are playing are all about balance. And if we can master that, we master human experience. And what is the mastery of human experience? Exemplified in that model of the Buddha, wholeness, the unification of our consciousness, the perception of true reality, which means we have the experience that everything is one. When we have mastered it, then we are free in this form. Otherwise, not. So this is the challenge huh, of human experience. Can we be that excellent in our focus? Can you be the all-time best that it is possible to be, moment by moment. If you choose it and you actualize it, the reward is your freedom. Absolute freedom in the oneness of truthful reality. And that's the moksha or the liberation of the ancient traditions, the enlightening experience of wholeness. In the Western models, we call it the eternal quest for wholeness. All forms, everyone and everything, constantly evolving its wholeness. Hmm? Through all form, the one only has the intention to fully be itself, to be whole. So again, master the mechanics of it hmm, and experience oneness or wholeness through balance. Now let's go back to meditation. Remember I said meditation is the foremost balancing technique in all of the holistic models of reality. And yet like any other technique or tradition, uh, they become antiquated and we get stuck in the history of our experience because we're habitual creatures and we're fear-based. Fear is the dominant polarity. We, we don't like change. We like habitual repetition 
of what we know. Why do we like habitual repetition of what we know? Because it's safe. We're secure in the habit of what we know. It's not that we fear the unknown. We fear the relinquishment of what we know. So we hang on to all these old, habitual ways of experiencing life as human beings. And an easy way to observe that is in terms of the religions of our cultures. We cling to an old book, and we say it's the only book. It's the only way. You cannot change it. You must keep repeating it over and over and over again. And yet, consciousness is evolving. Times are changing. Uh, these times are not the same times as 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago when that book first emerged. Why are we still repeating the same experience and finding that it doesn't work? It doesn't deliver the wholeness, doesn't deliver the fulfillment of wholeness that is the driving force of our own consciousness. Well, the same could be said of meditation. <clears throat> Do you live in a cave? How many of you own a cave? Hmm? then why are you practicing meditation that was designed in a cave 10,000 years ago in the Himalayas? Are you comfortable screwing your body into a pretzel? Hmm? Do you like a smelly, musty cave to meditate in? <clears throat> Do you use oil lamps instead of electricity? Hmm. Um, how about, uh, why don't we all just drive Model T Fords instead of BMWs? Mm -hmm. works, but won't get you there as fast. Old technology, old habits, mm -hmm. die hard. So in this understanding, we have to look at meditation. <clears throat> How can we modernize? How can we contemporize? Could we say it's time for a new God? The old God doesn't work. The old God of separation. The old God who lives in heaven. Mm, if we do it right, right? You know, if we obey all the rules and we get it right, we might gain heavenly admittance uh, when we die. Mm, but even in heavenly admittance, do we get to be one with our God? Or we just get to hang out in proximity to the big throne with all the angels and the dude with the beard? So the new God whose time has come is you and me and all of humanity and all forms of life in the awareness of our oneness. And so it is with meditation. We can do the old style of meditation, but is it suitable to the world in which we live? Will you have the same experience in your square rectangular flat in London or New York or wherever as the ancient yogi had in his cave in the Himalayas 5,000 years ago. No, he won't, because the world has changed. Did he have around him a population that we have now? When you're in your little flat meditating in the middle of London, how many million minds are surrounding you, generating their thoughts, their data, and the frequencies of their vibrations that are affecting you. The yogi in the cave didn't have that. Hmm? <clears throat> Did the yogi in the cave have electricity running through all the walls surrounding him, creating an incoherent or imbalanced frequency of vibration that affected his biochemistry, hormonal chemistry, and neurochemistry? No, he didn't. Hmm? <clears throat> Did the yogi of 5,000 years ago have all the pollution we have, the electromagnetic pollution? cell phones, radio waves, television waves, microwaves, all bombarding us. And here we are trying to meditate in a 5,000-year-old way and get frustrated that we can't experience balance and wholeness. Duh. <clears throat> Maybe we might want to uh, reconsider hmm, the mechanics of our process here, our technique. And so this is what I looked into many, many years ago because my teacher said to me, you got to modernize. Uh, find a way to contemporize, to update these ancient models.
models into a context that is congruent with modern life. So I took meditation and I examined every parameter of it and I related it to the human brain. In order to understand the nature of relative reality as represented by our brain as the control center of our experience. And what do you find? We have two polarities in our brain. Right hemisphere, left hemisphere. <clears throat> For the most part, we are left brain dominant. The negative, the objective, uh, is the dominant polarity. Uh, so we have a fragmented or imbalanced experience. Meditation balances the two sides of the brain or synchronizes them. Therefore, the term synchronicity, uh, meaning whole brain function. When our brain functions holistically, both sides balance each other. Our perception of reality becomes holistic. And that's what happens in classical meditation or any form of meditation. Proportional to brain synchronization is deceleration of the brainwave frequency. We go from the very fast beta frequencies to the very slow delta rhythms. And proportional to that, the two sides of the brain balance. But low-tech forms of meditation are random. Mm -hmm. One day you might have a good meditation. You know, the minds around you are a little bit more quiet. There's not as much electromagnetic pollution, etc., etc., and you have a decent meditation. You attain some whole brain synchrony. Next day, the world around you is crazy, you're crazy, your biorhythms are off, you can't get across the street with your meditation. Your mind won't shut up for two seconds. You can't generate enough theta delta frequencies to have any whole brain function or any balance in your form. So, is there a way mm, that we can assist ourselves in terms of balancing the brain and meditation with technology? And the answer, of course, is yes. Because if consciousness creates everything, hasn't it created technology? So why wouldn't we embrace the cutting edge of consciousness and technology and apply it life affirmatively and truthfully to our own balance and our own wholeness? So understanding all of this, I went and measured the caves of the Himalayas. I wanted to see what was the nature of the vibration of relative consciousness in that space that assisted the yogi when he sat in it to experience balance and wholeness. And it's all measurable. And what you basically understand is that if you create a balanced environment, the brain simply follows that frequency of vibration. If you have an imbalanced environment, your brain follows that. The brainwave profiles of precision meditation and holistic experience have been mapped now for about 75 years. <clears throat> the brainwave profile is called the enlightened mind. Uh, it was demonstrated on the meditating monks of both the Zen tradition and the meditating monks of the Dalai Lama. So we know what the pattern looks like, and we also know that we can entrain the brain with vibrational frequency. So if I could create sonically mm, the awakened mind-brain profile, the meditative brainwave profile, and I could <coughs> sit in the environment of that entrainment, after a certain period of time my brain would start following that, move into that pattern, and my perception of reality would move from fragmented to holistic or I would be experiencing precision meditation. And that's all because the auditory nerve goes deepest into the midbrain. So sonic vibratory technology most deeply affects us. And that's what they were using in the caves. They sat in the cave, was hollowed out of the stone mountain, the stone vibrates in the alpha theta frequency, the earth resonance, Schumann resonance, 7.8 hertz, alpha frequency. <clears throat> in the cave, they used musical instruments that were very droning, a tambura. It interacted with the Schumann resonance and decelerated the brain wave further. And then they subjectively focused, and it was easy to actualize the unified state. 
So I took all of that information, I created the sonic technology, I put it through stereo headphones and I brought the cave to my ears. But I was now doing so with precision. Every single time I put it on, the brain followed it and delivered the precision EEG of unified meditation. <clears throat> so this became high-tech meditation uh, and it's what I became known for. And now through hundreds of thousands of daily applications of this technology, many, many people have been able to experience meditation in the West, in very imbalanced environments. They have been able to create balance and experience the precision technology of balance uh, that is technological meditation. And that's what you've been listening to here uh, in this room this evening. This sound of the ocean is masking a sonic matrix underneath it that is decelerating your brain waves uh, and increasing your whole brain synchrony. So as you've been sitting here, you might notice that you're more relaxed or you think you're a little sleepy and tired or it's been a long day uh, or you're feeling a little more opiated than normal. <clears throat> That's because of the sonic entrainment and its interaction with your brain. And when we increase the synchrony in your brain, we increase the production of your natural neurochemical endorphins. And you are opiating yourself. That's why when you meditate, we have the bliss of meditation. It's about the increased production of neurochemical opiates. The bliss of enlightenment is the whole brain state mm, that causes the increase in the secretion of neurochemical opium. So here we are, sitting just in a balanced environment using only sound. And look at the difference it can make. It can change our perception of reality. It can expand our awareness. Balance, wholeness, whole brain synchrony, more unified state of experience or the relaxation response in the brain. So, the word that is important to remember in all the holistic models of reality is constancy. How do you make this experience of meditation constant? And the answer is repetition. If you repeat the pattern daily, the brain remembers it. It stores the pattern, and then any time you focus, your brain says, ah, oh, meditation, and brings up that pattern, moves into the meditative EEG, and then progressively, you become more and more constant in the state of whole brain synchrony, and that's what denoted enlightenment in the classical traditions. You were constant in that brainwave profile. You were consistently generating whole brain synchrony or whole brain function. <clears throat> so daily meditation with precision technology creates that constancy and produces a fourfold acceleration factor or remote tech forms of meditation. Simply because it's precision technology. And precision always yields efficiency in linear time and space. <clears throat> so you can take a Model T or you could ride in a Ferrari. <laughs> the choices we present ourselves with today are absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is what is high-tech meditation. How can we take this principle and add it to all aspects of our lives? Well, if we can do this with sound, and we could simply play it within our home, uh, it would create constantly a, a balanced environment. But what else could we do? What about the next nerve that goes deepest into the midbrain? First is auditory, second is olfactory. <laughs> Smell. Mm -hmm. If we understood aroma and aromatherapy and we mixed the right frequencies of vibration in flower essences, we could create a balanced, more balanced environment than just sound. That was the old principle of incense that were made out of flowers and 
ground up aromatics uh, that were burned in the caves that assisted the increase in whole brain synchrony. We can now do that with essential oils and aromatherapy and precision formulas <coughs> that we pump into our environment. So we have sound, we have fragrance. <coughs> what about sight and color? Color is vibrational frequency. We can paint our rooms red <coughs> and have a very fragmented experience. Or we can paint our rooms in more pastel colors, the blues, the violets, uh, and totally create whole brain synchrony just in our perception of the color that surrounds us. So in all these ways, through all our sensory perception and sensory input, we can create a balanced environment and sit ourselves in it and be supported in creating the balanced state, the whole brain synchrony, and the holistic enlightening experience in a modern way that is congruent with the times in which we are living, which is the cutting edge of the evolution of individuated consciousness or the experience of where our feet are. It is, to me, simply masterfully playing the game, utilizing everything at the cutting edge of consciousness to support wholeness. There are now even technologies that you can plug into the wall that will change the electrical signal from incoherent to coherent. It'll take the imbalance out of the electromagnetic field that surrounds you. There are brilliant technologies available uh, that assist with balance in an imbalanced world. To me, this is all part of the new God whose time has come. Mm -hmm. So in that understanding, high-tech meditation, technological assistance, harness life affirmatively and truthfully contributes to our balance and our wholeness, and that's how we can live with balance in an imbalanced world. For every force in life, there is a counterforce. Mastery is balance. Huh? Balance the dimensions of your experience and have a truthful, sane perception of reality as holistic, unified, one and single. And, and then experience and validate through your experience the truth of the statement, there is only one. The one is the many. Hmm? So this is what we call the synchronicity experience. And of course, as they say of me, I'll never win a Grammy, but I've gone platinum with meditation. I like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this modern form of meditation has assisted thousands and thousands of people to meditate in a precision way and actualize greater and greater. So I'm happy to share it with you. And what I'd like to do now is meditate with you. Would you like to do that for a few minutes? I'll change the soundtrack. We'll play one of the synchronicity soundtracks. And then I'm going to change the sonic technology. What we've been listening to is just alpha, mm -hmm. light meditation, light balance. I'm going to deepen it down now into the theta level. See if we can increase our synchrony, increase our balance, and then expand our awareness even more. So you yeah, have spread out, be comfortable. <clears throat> and all we have to do in this meditation is listen. Listen to the music. And as in any form of meditation, uh, we want to be as wakeful as we can be as present. So try to stay with the music and hear each note. Can we be that present, uh, that focused, that note by note, we're right here? And that's all that's required. Technology will do the rest. Mm -hmm. Let's have a focused intention, and we'll sit quietly, and I'll guide us through a little bit as we go for a few minutes, have a little deeper experience of the precision 
of high tech meditation. All right, Maestro, you ready? Whenever you're ready, we're ready. And we can lower the
experience is, it is appropriate. <coughs> Just continue your meditative focus, your observation. slowly transition as you open your eyes <coughs> from the interior to the exterior. Observant, you see that you have shifted the whole vibration of this room. It's okay to cough. Just a few minutes, precision meditation, and you change your perception of reality. You transform yourself. Transformation of the world is not about doing. It's about being. So, this is the synchronicity experience. This is modern spirituality. Technological holistic lifestyle that is congruent with the times in which we are living. If you find it resonates with you, you are welcome in my world. And whatever you experience is. For you. These are challenging times on this planet. It is prophesied that in our lifetimes we will experience a in consciousness. That as human beings we will have to move to more holistic experiences of reality and relinquish our egocentric for those who are truthful, these are exciting times. For those who are fragmented, they are frightening times. But most importantly, it is time to be one, to break down the barriers between people cultures and nations and come to an equality in consciousness. We